Hey, it's KJ with Living Christian, and welcome to the Bible Reading and Coffee Drinking Podcast. If this is your first time here, what we do on this podcast is read a chapter of the Bible, drink a little bit of coffee, and talk a whole lot about Jesus along the way. Each episode dives into Scripture and discusses it in a somewhat modern and relatable way. I'll also be answering some questions from my social media followers. Oh, and we'll drink coffee along the way as well. If you feel the urge to support the podcast, you can do so right here on the podcast page. If this podcast helps you grow in your faith, maybe consider sending it to a friend or uh, maybe dropping a rating or review. It certainly helps us get the word out. And also, make sure you check out livingchristian.org for Bible verse lists, Christian blog, an apparel store with a bunch of Christian t-shirts, hoodies, hats, and more. It's awesome. All at livingchristian.org. And if you're there, make sure you use the code PODCAST20. That's a special code for 20% off our entire store only for our podcast listeners. So PODCAST20. Use that when you're on livingchristian.org. Now, let's get to the episode. All right, welcome to another edition of Bible Reading and Coffee Drinking. We are in Isaiah 53 today. So uh, if this is your first time joining us, uh, we're working our way through the top 10 favorite chapters of the Bible. We're in six, I think now, uh, of mine. Check it out at livingchristian.org for that list. I'll get that up uh, soon, and you can listen to all of them if you want to on the podcast or watch them on YouTube or check us out on Instagram and watch the video over there. But today is Isaiah 53. The reason why Isaiah 53 is important, at least to me, is um, it was written uh, six or seven hundred years before Jesus was born. So Isaiah the prophet lived around 600 to 700 BC, okay? They found the scrolls about, I'm sorry if my history is wrong, but I think it's right around 160 BC uh, they found the scrolls. Uh, so that dates back 600 to 700 years uh, before Christ. So Isaiah 53 is talking about the coming Messiah and what's going to happen. And it is so um, tied in to the gospel and tied in to the story of Jesus that it is absolutely amazing uh, how that was 700 years before it actually happened. So let's read Isaiah 53. We'll talk about it along the way, and then I'll uh, answer some questions afterwards. I have a sip of coffee before we get going. All right, Isaiah 53. Uh, so if you go back a little bit into 52, uh, just the, the, the paragraph before, uh, it talks about the Lord's suffering servant is what he's called. Okay, See, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. So we're going to read all that, but it's setting the tone for the fact that it's the suffering servant. Uh, so Jesus is the Messiah, or the Messiah at the time is what they're referring to, is, uh, is a suffering servant, okay? All right, verse 1. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's present presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. My servant, verse 2, my servant grew up in the Lord's presence. So he's already setting the tone that the Messiah, or the servant, uh, uh, is is grew up in heaven with the Father. All right. There is nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. Nothing to attract us to him. This goes in line with the fact that Jesus was a man of the times. Right. Fully God. Fully man. But the the man part of him uh, is uh, is just a, just a normal human being. Uh, nothing special about him. Verse three. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Especially if you're a um, a Jewish person reading Isaiah and, and 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 understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, reading that has to hit home. Uh, verse four. Yet it it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we would be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Let's compact or let's read a little more in depth of verse 4 here. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. What weighed Jesus down? The cross. And we thought his troubles were a punishment for God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He's describing, I mean, the words that Isaiah used describe the crucifixion in many ways. He was pierced, if you remember correctly, 
after they beat Jesus, they pierced his side to make sure he was dead. He was beaten so we could make it whole. He was whipped. All those are correlative to the gospel. All those are correlative to uh, the passion and, and the fact that he was getting uh, crucified. He was whipped. He was beaten. All those things. So he's foretelling what's going to happen to the Messiah when he gets here. Verse 6. He, all of us, like sheep, have strayed away. Okay. Think about why he chose the word, all of us, like sheep, have strayed away. Have strayed away. All right, Jesus is the shepherd. He's the good shepherd, as we all know. Even in the story, I remember we were talking yesterday in church about um, the 99, right? And, and how Jesus told that story uh, of the shepherd who had a flock and one had strayed, right? And hopefully you know that story. He, he left the 99 to go find the one, the one sheep that had strayed, right? It wasn't about the ones that were in the group, the one that he knew that he, that he knew that weren't going to stray. He went after the one that strayed. Jesus cares about the lost, okay? He, 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 he loves the found, right? But he goes after the lost so he can save them too. So think about how Isaiah said, all of us, like sheep have strayed away. We have strayed. We're the straying sheep. We're the one, right? We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet God laid on him the sins of us all. So even though we're the one, we're the lost, we're the sheep that stray, Jesus has all of our sins laid on him. He's foretelling the gospel. All right, sip of coffee before we go to seven. It's, it's deep stuff, but it's good stuff. Verse seven. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and a sheep in silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. So the, at the time they used sheep, a lot of times, as a sacrifice. He was a sacrificial lamb, as we all hopefully know. This is foretelling that. He was led like a sacrificial lamb to the slaughter. And he was quiet about it. Right? He knew it was coming. Which, if you know the gospel, if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, you know that Jesus knew what was going to happen. Okay? <laughs> Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, so Jesus never had children or family, that his life was cut short in midstream, he's in his 30s, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. So Jesus was struck down, he, he was sacrificed, he died for us. He had done no wrong, and he had never deceived anyone, he was buried like a criminal, but he was buried like a criminal, he was put in a rich man's grave. That's interesting. So if you think about that, if you know the story uh, of um, where Jesus was laid, all right, he wasn't. Most of the times when they had uh, these crucifixions with these criminals and so forth, they would just throw them in the ditch and like have mass grave burials. But a rich man came up and wanted Jesus' body and put him in a tomb. Right, That wasn't normal for, for criminals at the time to be put in tombs. They were just buried in mass graves. So think about it right here. He says, he was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. It was always the plan. Right? It was always the Heavenly Father's plan that Jesus was going to come down and sacrifice himself. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. So in the, in the, in the worldly sense, if you go back to uh, verse 8, he died without descendants. And you come fast track over to 10... It says, when his life is made for offering for sin, he will have many descendants. We are all children of God, okay? He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear our sins. I will give him the honor of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He counted. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for the rebels. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the last couple of uh, verses here. When he sees all that he is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. Jesus knew this was coming. Okay, He knew he was going to have to be sacrificed. <clears throat> he was a little leery of it as, as he prayed to the Father. 
asking why, you know, is this the only way type of deal? But afterwards, what this, what Isaiah is saying is the Messiah, Jesus, would understand and look back and be satisfied. Because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. Think about that. He was the righteous man. He was God that came down to be with us, righteous, whole, pure, sinless. But yet because of his sacrifice, he considers us righteous. He counts us righteous because he will bear all of our sins. How comforting is that, huh? He was counted among the rebels. I love this part. (laughs) He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for the rebels. Think about what rebels do. They fight against the system, right? Rebels don't like rules, <laughs> right? And in many ways, <clears throat> the Christians of today are the rebels, according to you know the Old Testament, because we don't abide or follow the commandments in order to get to heaven. Right? Whether it's the Mosaic Law, which we need to follow because of the fact that we're saved, but they're really the old Levitical laws and some of those things, which you talked about here before. We rebel against those. We eat shell- shellfish. I, I trim my beard. I cut my hair. I, I, you, know, you, you do those things, right? So in many ways, we're rebels against the Levitical laws. Uh, we don't have to um, you know, abide by them because of what Jesus did in Isaiah 53. And it talks about he bore the sins of many and interceded for the rebels. So because he bore, he died for our sins. He fulfilled the law. Therefore, we don't, we're not bound by Levitical laws in order to earn favor with God or, or earn our way to heaven. Because of Jesus and our faith in Jesus Christ, we're good. <laughs> All right? That's Isaiah 53 in a nutshell. It's it, that's it. So how do you read it? When you read Isaiah 53, maybe you haven't read before, but as, as you hear me read it, can you correlate the words of Jesus? The Jewish people of even today are still waiting on Isaiah 53 to be fulfilled. Even though when I read it, <clears throat> word for word, line by line, verse by verse, I see it and I think about the Gospels. I think about the story of Jesus. I think it's so exact and precise telling what's going to happen 700 years after this was written. It's absolutely, the prophecy there is is, uh, amazing to me. And and there's so many uh, stories in the Old Testament. Once you realize and understand the New Testament, uh, you go, you can go back and read some of the Old Testament and just go, "Wow, that's I, that's that." Okay, that happened in Luke, or that happened here, um, and it, it's and you read through it, it's it's absolutely amazing. There's there's so many stories in the Old Testament that are are, are metaphors or or other tellings of what happens in Revelation or what happens in the Gospels. All of it. All of it. Story of Noah, part in the Red Sea, Exodus, all that stuff is a correlative story to what Jesus is doing, leading us and saving us. Uh, it's pretty amazing. So I love to read the Old Testament. I read the entire Old Testament last year in 2022, and uh, I read the New Testament in 2021. So I kind of did it backwards, but I, I did that on purpose. And I like to do that. It's just for me, I love to read... Um, the story of Jesus and the Gospels and how the church was started in Acts and, and all the stuff that, that Paul writes. I, I, I love that because it's so correlative and, and fresh. And then I love to go back to the Old Testament and reference it and realize the, the connections. And you can do it the other way, obviously. You can start with the Old Testament and read all the way through. And, and, and hopefully when you're reading the New Testament, you go, oh, I remember just reading that. Um, but I did it backwards, and it was an interesting um, exercise for me to read the New Testament, have that so fresh in my mind. Uh, as I go back and read Genesis and Exodus and he, all the way through, you know, in Daniel and, and Isaiah and being able to make those correlations to the New Testament that I had just read, right? So it, it was kind of fresh in my mind. So I like doing that. So if you haven't done that, it's an interesting exercise. You can do the whole thing in a year if you want to. Uh, I read it, in, I did it in two years only because we did it here. 
uh, on uh, the Instagram page. Uh, but um, And the New Testament, you, it doesn't take a year to read. Uh, but it was r- nice reading the Old Testament. It's, it's lengthy. And some of those, um, especially some of the ones like in Joshua and Judges, and it's tough to read. It takes me a while to get through, so I'm not just breezing through it. I wanted to actually read and digest it. So <clears throat> hopefully you guys liked Isaiah 53. Um, and uh, on Friday we'll do a different book. All right, so let's answer a few questions, and uh, we'll get on down with our week. Hopefully you guys have a, a great week planned. Uh, <clears throat> let's see what questions we have now. Um all right, I'm a podcast subscriber. This is my first live. Hey, hey, Mary, thanks for joining me live and on the podcast. All right, let's uh, let's read uh, a few questions here. Uh, okay, uh, does God really answer prayers? Uh, yes, I, I firmly believe God answers prayers in, in, in a couple of different ways. Um, uh, for me personally, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I think God answers prayers in, in three, may, maybe more ways. One would be, yes, I pray for something, and it actually comes true. Um, no, um, in the sense of uh, I pray for something, and God does not provide it because it's not where he wants me to be. You can consider that unanswered prayers, which is fine. And the third way is, uh, yes, but I got something different planned for you. Um, or, a, or a maybe, or you know, what have you, that, that kind of in the middle. So absolutely, I've had prayers that I've uh, prayed and have come directly true. I prayed for something, and whether it was a day, a week, a year, five years down the road, according to God's timing, it happened. And I can go back and go, I remember I prayed so hard for that to happen, and it happened. There's also times that I prayed so hard for things that, looking back, I'm glad God didn't provide me. A, it wasn't part of his plan. So your prayers will be answered if you're praying according to God's will. That's for sure. So you always have to trust him that he knows better. And that third way, it's, okay, yeah, I hear your prayer, but I'm going to give you something different because that's what I want for you. So yes, no, or, or, or different uh, is typically the way that uh, I hear prayers. Uh, so if, you, if you've been praying hard for something and it hasn't come true, either have time, patience with God's timing, or uh, look for a door to open that um, God wants you to go through. Not the one you want to go through, but he's providing a different way because he has something else planned for you. Uh, that is for sure. And I've, I've had that happen in my life time and time again. Um, let's, uh, let, if God has a plan for you, can he change his mind based on your prayer and things you ask? Uh, I firmly don't believe so. I think God has a plan for my life. I feel that... He has my path laid out. I don't understand it at times. Uh, I don't understand um, where he's leading me at times. Um, that I do think that maybe, I mean, it's something I want to ask God about. Like, hey, when I asked, when I prayed over and over and over again, did you change your plan for me? Right? Did, did you adjust things because you saw that I wanted these things? <clears throat> I don't know if that's the way God works, to be honest with you, but uh, it's a good question. And it's a good conversation I'm, I'll plan to have on him one day. Uh, I don't think so. I think he's got uh, our, our, our path laid out for us. He knows where we're going, uh, and, and he's navigating us through uh, this life to get to where he wants us to be. It's kind of like, uh, and I've used this correlation before, and seeing that you know we're in the end of the football season, American football here <clears throat> in the United States, he already knows the score. He knows who wins, uh, and, and uh, he's letting me make decisions along the way and, and letting me call plays, and some plays work really well, and some plays don't. Uh, he's allowing me to do that. Uh, he's allowing me to, to to run right or pass left, uh, but he knows that what how many points I'm going to score at the end of the game. He already knows that. If that makes sense. Uh, so it's kind of a weird thing, but it's interesting. I, there's lots of conversations I want to have with him and asking him questions like that myself. Uh, all right, let's have uh, another question here. Uh, boop, 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 boop. All right. Hello. Uh, hello, Stacy. Uh, should I feel bad for breaking up with my non-Christian boyfriend who respected God? But I was not at ease in the relationship like there was something odd. Okay. Um, there's a couple of thoughts on, on, on this. So I would say going back to what God has planned for you, if that makes sense. Um, you know, the Bible does talk about being equally yoked. I do think that if you're dating for in hopes of being married someday, which is the right way to do it, right? Uh, you got to make sure that y'all have the same values and the same thoughts. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, you can't be a good influence on a non-believer. You can't help a non-believer believe. That certainly is happens all the time, if that makes sense. 
But when you're going into marriage with somebody, you want to make sure that uh, you're quote unquote equally yoked, so to speak. So uh, I would say uh, I would pray about it and I'll pray for you about it. Uh, and, and see where God leads you on that. I wouldn't feel bad. And your question was, well, should you feel bad about breaking up with your non-Christian boyfriend? You should never feel bad about anything. God takes people out of our lives and brings people into our lives all the time. We need to trust what God does with that. Sometimes it's not <clears throat> you doing it. You may think that you're breaking up with your boyfriend, but in reality, God is removing that person out of your life because they're not good for you. So my question is, on any time dating, right, whether it's dating, marriage, what have you, are you, are you, you know, is that person bringing you closer to Jesus or is he pulling you away from Jesus? The answer is pulling you away from Jesus or distracting you from Jesus. Then you know the answer. You know how that's going to work itself out. And sometimes it takes a day or a week. Sometimes it takes years to get kind of get through that relationship a little bit. But that's any relationship, whether it's friendship, uh, dating, marriage, what have you. I always try to look at it in the sense of are these people, is this person in my life uh, bringing me closer or pulling me away? And I'm, I'll be 50 this year. I know I don't look it. Maybe I do. I probably look older, but I'll be 50 this year. So if there's anything I've learned uh, in my, you know, half a century here on this planet is uh, I've seen people come and go uh, out of my life. And, and sometimes it hurt, right? And, and sometimes it was painful. Uh, but in the long term, I realized that God was moving my life down the road. And those people weren't he didn't mean for those people to be part of my path. So I have peace in that. So pray about it. See where God leads you on that. But going back to the you know the un, the prayers uh, question that we got, he could be leading you into a different door, uh, and, and he needs your that person out of the way. <laughs> but uh, so pray about it and see where God leads you. But don't feel bad about uh, the people that God removes from your life for sure. Uh, it's bigger than you. And he's got bigger plans for you. All right, last question, and we'll uh, get get about our uh, get about our Monday. Have a... <clears throat> All right, let's see what we got here. Do 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 do. We've got lots of questions here. All right, so uh, this is a this is I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this, and even though it's it's always hard, right, to, to to wrap your head around this. If we have chosen to follow God. Can he still reject us for our sins when he comes again? Absolutely not. Of course he can. Okay, let me rephrase that. God can do anything. (laughs) Will he? No. Will he? No. He will not reject us for our sins. That's the whole purpose of what we just read in Isaiah 53. And the whole purpose of the gospel is to show you that if you follow Christ, and if you give your life to Jesus, then your sins are forgiven. Yeah, there's things he wants you to do, right? There's things he wants you to do once you accept Jesus as your Savior. He wants you to repent and and ask for forgiveness. He wants you to get baptized. He wants you to obey some of the commandments. But that's not dependent on your salvation. That's because you are saved and have a relationship with him, and he wants you to be changed, okay? I have, you know, Matthew 22 on my arm. What is that for? It's the greatest commandment. They asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was. He says, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second one, equally as important, is love your neighbor as love yourself. It's not. He's commanding us to do this. He's commanding his followers to do this. He's not saying that you have to do this in order to get to heaven. He's not saying you have to do this in order for me to forgive you of your sins. What he's saying is, hey, now that you're in a relationship with me, this is what I expect of you. This is what how you can be an example on earth of me. So if you're broken and you feel sinful, and maybe you've accepted Christ, but you keep falling into those sins again, keep praying, keep asking for forgiveness, and keep working on your relationship with Jesus. That's a lifelong struggle, my friends. We all. I've been a Christian most of my life, more active in the last 20 years than I was the first 20, right? But that's still a struggle. We all, we all sin. This world is broken, and it pulls us away from Jesus as much as it can. Everything. The devil is using everything, entertainment, people, everything, to pull us away and distract us from Jesus. It's a lifelong struggle. It doesn't mean that I'm not saved. It doesn't mean that you're not saved because of your sins. It doesn't mean that you're not saved because of your future sins. 
Jesus was the sacrifice. And he died for your sins. And you, you have to accept that. You have to believe it and accept it and walk with Christ. At that point, it's all washed clean. That's what the Bible tells us. You are washed clean. You are forgiven. You are healed. You are in a different place in eternity. Believe that. If you believe that, then, yeah, you're going to sin, but you're going to struggle with it, and you're going to fight not to. I know there's times when I, I blatantly sin, and I know it's wrong, and I have such guilt afterwards. I pray, and I ask for forgiveness, but I know He forgives me. It's just my kind of own human emotions. I struggle with it. I struggle with it because I feel I let him down, if that makes sense. Maybe you feel that way sometimes, too. I hate that feeling. I hate that feeling of letting Jesus down. I hate that feeling, but I have it sometimes, and you probably do, too. That's okay. It tells you where your heart is in the right place, right? It tells you that, you know, you really want to, you know, you love Jesus so much that you, you, you don't want to disappoint him. He's not. He's fine. He, he sees everything, right? He sees all of us all day long. And uh, I'm sure when we get to heaven, he's just going to wrap his arms around us and just go, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I got you. I got you. All right. All right. Let's let's uh, let's pray and we'll get out of here. If you missed any part of this, uh, make sure you check it out on the podcast. Uh, and if you're listening to the podcast right now, uh, welcome. And uh, go listen to some of their episodes. I think we've got uh, 37, 38, 39 episodes, something like that on the podcast. Uh, so uh, go back and listen to uh, all the other chapters that I've read through the last uh, year or so. All right, let's say a quick prayer and we'll go about our week, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us together and showing us these prophetic words of Isaiah, how it foretold of your son, Jesus, hundreds of years before he got here. It's, it, it fills us with understanding and the fact that you know everything from the beginning on how it's going to end. Whether it's giving these words to the prophet Isaiah to foretell of Jesus coming because you knew he was coming. You knew that the, the sun was going to be on the earth hundreds of years later. Or you know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow you know and you can see throughout those timelines differently than we can. And those prophecies give us comfort and give us proof that you are real. And we're so thankful for that. Father, I, I ask for you to be with the people hurting today. The people watching this or listening to this right now, as they struggle with their sin, they struggle with understanding how Jesus could love them. They struggle to understand their purpose and why you have them where you have them. I'm praying for you to give them comfort, give them direction, and give them patience, me included. We love you and trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Love you guys. Have a great Monday. Rest of the week. We'll, we'll get it back together on Friday and read another chapter. Till next time, keep forever in your heart. Jesus on your mind. Love you guys.